Great to see you this morning. Glad that you are here uh, as we launch a brand new series called The ABCs of Financial Freedom. And I'm so excited about this. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but maybe you're doing really, really well financially. Maybe this is a great time for you. Maybe you're struggling financially. I know that in seasons of my own life, <clears throat> uh, I've had area, seasons that have been really good financially where we've had a lot of discipline in our lives and things have gone well, and then we've kind of gotten you know, a little loosey-goosey with our finances. And so this is a great thing for me personally. My wife and I are very excited about this series because uh, this is a time for us to kind of refocus and, and, and shore up some things that perhaps have gotten a little loose. And so I'm excited about it personally, and I am glad that you are with us today. And you may be wondering, James, why in the world are we doing a series on finances, right? Uh, you may be thinking, why? I, can, I can go to Barnes & Noble, I can go to Amazon, I can go to a lot of different places, YouTube, and watch, you know, and read about financial stuff there. Why would we talk about it in church? Oh, James, I know why we're talking about it in church, because all the church wants is my, yeah, you already knew the answer to that, didn't you? Well, here's the thing. I just want to let you know right up front why we're doing this. Number one, we are not in financial crisis. All right? We're just not in financial crisis. In fact, one of the things I enjoy about what I get to do is I get to plan for messages and message series, and sometimes I kind of go crazy with it. I get way out ahead, and I, to, the honest to goodness truth is, is that back in 2014, when I was thinking about what we were going to be preaching that year, and then I started to look, well, how does that tie into 2015? I rolled into 2015, I rolled into 2016, 17, and on, on my preaching calendar for 2018, back in 2014, I put financial series at the beginning of 2018. So this series has been planned for a long time. Like I knew it was coming. It has nothing to do with, oh my goodness, things are going bad. We need money. This is just a regular part of it, all right? So we're not in financial crisis. This is not why we're doing this series, all right? The next thing that I got to tell you about is this. A full 30% of Jesus' teaching was on money and possessions. Do you realize that? Almost a third of what Jesus taught, his actual teachings, was about money and possessions. And so I, I started thinking about that. And I went back over the last three years, uh, 2015, 16, and 17, I thought, well, how much have I taught where I've actually spent a message where we've talked about money and possessions? And I came up, uh, I found out that we did five messages. I've done five messages at, at Journey over the last three years on that. That is not 30%, that's 3%. All right? Now, if Jesus were the pastor of this church, he would have preached 48 sermons on money and possessions. And I realize we're a little bit behind, so for the next 42 weeks, we're going <laughs> to... I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But the honest goodness truth is, you know what? I, I don't know why I, I kind of short-circuited it because I realized, and i got to like really uh, honestly ask for your uh, forgiveness because this is not right. Jesus realized that this is a huge part of our lives, and he taught about it on a consistent basis, and I've just not done that very well over the last few years. And so we, I just realized, you know what? I'm glad I didn't skip over anything. I had some other things planned in the previous years, and for whatever reason, I skipped over them. But, but we're here now, and this is going to be hopefully very, very helpful for us. Now, another reason why we're doing this series is because <clears throat> normal is no way to live. When it comes to finances, normal is no way to live. And I'm just guessing that most of us in this room are normal. You say, well, James, what's normal? Here's what normal, I, as I was uh, preparing for this message, I ran across somebody who was writing about their own experience when it came to finances and what they wrote. It seemed every month I sat at the same table with the same worries, fears, and problems. No matter how hard I worked, it seemed I couldn't win. I was forever to be a slave of some banker to the government and to the needs of my family. When my wife and I talked about money, we ended up in a fight, leaving her feeling afraid and me feeling inadequate. I was positive of only one thing. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Anybody like that? That's normal right? I was tired of sitting down, doing the bills, and having a heaviness kind of come over me. They're just like, oh no, here we go again. The hopelessness was overwhelming. I felt like a gerbil in the wheel. Run, run, run. No traction, no ground covered. Maybe life was just a financial illusion. Oh, some months everything seemed to work 
and I thought maybe we were going to be okay, I could tell myself then, oh, well, this is just how everyone lives. This is just normal. These times, those times offered enough wiggle room that I could continue to lie to myself that we were making headway, but deep down, I knew we weren't. Ever been there? Ever feel like that? It's like, I don't know, maybe that's just the way it's going to be for my life and the way it's going to be. That's normal. Normal's not good enough. I don't want normal for you. I don't want normal for me. You know what normal looks like? Normal looks like this. That's normal. You know what this is? Anybody figured it out yet? It's $20 trillion. That's what our national debt is. It's at least that. That's just normal. We say that, you, I'm just telling you, you can't even fathom what a trillion is. Like, you can't wrap your head around a trillion. We, we've gone way past that. We say it all the time now. It's like, oh, yeah, the national debt's tri- it's like, oh, Where are we going out to eat tonight? We just blow right past it because we've just gotten so used to, like, that's normal. $20 trillion is normal. This is not a political statement. It doesn't make any difference who we send to Washington. This happens, right? It, this, is not a, this is not a political statement. I'm just saying, this is normal. We've just gotten used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we do things in our country. That's how we do things in life. Here's, here's something else that's normal right here, this number right here. 8,158. You know what that is? That's the average household credit card debt. In America, the average household carries $8,158 on their credit card. It just is always there. They're paying 20% interest or 18% interest or 25% interest. They're just going on and on and on and on. That's normal. I don't want normal. I don't want normal for you. I don't want normal for me. I don't want normal for our church. And I don't want really normal for our country. Good, great. But I can't do anything. I'm not president. So I can't do anything about that. But you know what? We can do something about our own lives, can't we? We can. I have a friend by the name of Barry, my friend Barry. Barry is a pastor. His name is Barry Cameron. Barry's a pastor. I met Barry a number of years ago. And uh, Barry was normal like everybody else in the country. He had credit card debt. He had two car payments. He had a big mortgage. And he was feeling that overwhelming oppression, that financial oppression. And and he was a pastor and teaching about all kinds of stuff. And he just realized it was crushing. The weight on him was crushing. He didn't like paying the bills. He didn't feel like he was suffocating. I mean, he didn't like that suffocating feeling. And so he just had to come to Jesus meeting with his family and just said, "This, this is enough. We can't do this anymore. And so they started to figure out, you know what, what does the Bible actually say about this? I mean, beyond the giving part of it, because he knew about that, he's a pastor for crying out loud, right? It's like the Bible says a whole lot about managing money. It says a lot about debt. It says a lot about how to earn money. It says a whole lot about that. He just realized, you know what, there are principles in the Bible that I'm not exercising, and it is killing me because I'm not exercising them. And so they just got down to business, and over a few years, they just focused all of their energy, all of their financial energy. They paid off all of their credit card debts. They paid off all of their car payments. They paid off their mortgage, and by 2001, November 2000, or November 2015, Sorry, November 15th, 2001, that's what I meant to say. They achieved financial freedom. And he's been living in financial freedom all the time. In fact, I emailed Barry earlier this week. In two weeks from now, I'm going to spend about four days with Barry at a gathering of pastors. And, I'm just, and I do this every year. Where I spend about a week with Barry every year. And when it comes to finances, right, when we are in these groups, meetings, uh, churches from all over the country, big churches like massive-sized churches, we're one of the smallest churches represented in the group that I go to. But when, when the subject of finances comes up and someone starts speaking, when Barry talks, everybody in the room stops and they start to listen because he is above the rest in terms of how he manages his personal finances and he is so encouraging to us he's like guys you can do this you can do this you can do this and so Barry after getting out of debt he wrote a book he wrote this book it's called the ABCs of financial freedom this series is based on this book. It's not the same content. This is what I'm going to be talking about on Sunday mornings. It's different than this. And here's what we want. We don't want normal for you. So what we're going to do is on your way out today, we're going to give you a free copy of this book. Everybody gets a free copy of this book, right? And it's not, 
It's, and why are we doing that? It's because we don't want something from you. We want something for you. We, I want you to experience a life of financial freedom. That's what I want from you. I don't want you feeling the crushing weight of debt. That's not what I want. Here's what I want for you. That you live with financial peace and freedom. Does anybody want that? All right? That's what I want from you. I, I want this from you. That you never live with a crushing weight of debt again. Just, just think for a second. Just think what it would be like to have no payments. How's that feel? Just the thought of it. <sighs> Feels good, doesn't it? That's what I want from you. I want for, for you that you never worry about how you would make ends meet if you were suddenly laid off. Because I know you guys think about that. I know you think, oh my goodness, you know, what happens if my company turns down or what happens if they have layoffs? Because here's what I know. The economy may be good right now, but guess what? Bad's coming. Because this is what the economy does. Companies hire and then they lay off. They hire then they lay off. That's what happens. And guess what? Right now, we're in a season of good stuff. This is a perfect time to say, you know what? Instead of blowing it all away like everybody in our culture does, this is a time to store up because there is a bubble. It's coming. I'm not a down, you know, I'm not being a naysayer. I'm just telling you, this is true. How many of you know what I just said is true? Okay, okay, okay. Now, that's great. Now we're all on the same page. We can do something about this. This is a perfect time to actually, like, get our house in order. I don't want you to ever worry about this again. And you don't have to worry about that again. Here's the other thing I want for you. That you would never again argue about money with your spouse. You'd never feel jealous of your spouse because they spend more money and they just go off and do whatever they want. You're trying to be this. I don't want you to ever feel that way. I don't want you to ever have any tension in your home or in your family about finances again. How, much, how many of you would like that? Yeah, there you are. Careful. They're sitting next to you. <laughs> All right. Here's another thing. That you would have the financial freedom. This is huge. That you would have the financial freedom to do whatever God lays on your heart to do. Like... Yeah, you can get excited about that one, right? That, that you feel like, hey, God is calling me to do this. And so many of you have felt the tug of God on your heart for one thing or another, but you can't because your finances won't allow you to. What would it be like to live in such a way, to have your financial picture in such a way that whatever God calls you to do, you can just go do? You don't have to worry about it. Guess what? You can have that kind of life. You can that's what I want from you. Some of you say, oh, I'd love to go on a mission trip, but I don't have any money to do that. Or I'd, I'd, love to go, I'd love to go spend a month serving at this one thing or spend six months serving with me. You can't do that. Why? Because you're not in a financial position to do that. But I want you, I wish everyone were in a position that you could just do whatever God lays on your heart to do. That's what I want from you. And that's why we're doing this series. Does any of this sound good to you? Anybody? This is what you want, right? Wouldn't this be good? All this stuff, right? Yeah. Golf clap. <laughs> it's all right to be excited about this. All right? Here's the thing. What we're going to talk about today, this is going to be a four-week message series. The book has six chapters in it. I want you to read every chapter, every word in this book because, again, what I'm going to be talking about on Sunday, same theme, but Barry's going to take it dive down deeper in it, okay? So you got to read this. You say, well, James, I'm not a reader. It's like, okay, look, 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 look. Do you want financial freedom or not? Then read the book. Be here every week, all right? Be here every week and read, and read the book. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. How good is that, right? So here's the thing. What we're going to talk about today is the single greatest idea, single greatest principle when it comes to experiencing financial freedom. We're starting off with the big one today. This is the biggest thing because if you get this one right, it'll work. If you misstep on this one, it's not going to work. If you misstep on this one, you will never experience financial peace and financial freedom. Anybody want to know what that one is? Right, and again, it's like you should come back next week, but I'm just telling you, if you don't get this one right, the rest of it doesn't work. This is like primary. So here's the bottom line. I'm going to give it to you up front. Here's the bottom line. Bottom line, changing your attitude about money is the beginning of financial freedom. Changing your attitude, how you think about money, is the beginning of financial freedom. Because if you don't change your attitude, nothing changes. If you don't change your attitude, nothing changes. Or here's another way to say this. Changing my attitude about money is the beginning of financial freedom. 
All right, say that with me out loud. Changing my attitude about money is the beginning of financial freedom. Let's say it again. Changing my attitude about money is the beginning of financial freedom. Because if something doesn't change in your head about how you view money, then nothing is going to change. We're going to just be normal like everybody else in America is. And I don't, I hate normal. How many of you would like to be like Barry Cameron, debt free, financially free? Anybody want that? Yeah. That's extraordinary. I want extraordinary. I don't know about you. I want extraordinary. I'm kind of on that path. I'm not there yet, but I'm on that path, and I'm excited about it. That's why I'm excited personally about this series because, hey, this is going to be good stuff for me and for my family. Here's the thing. We know this is true, that my attitude, when it changes about money, it's the beginning of financial freedom because this next, this next idea is true. My attitude about money drives my decisions about money. How you think about money drives your behavior with money. How you think about money, how you perceive money actually indicates what you're going to do with your money. And if, you're, if your attitude, if you're thinking about money is all messed up, guess what your financial world is going to be? Messed up. Messed up thinking leads to messed up finances. This is what it's all about. Changing my attitude about money. Bottom line again, changing my attitude about money is the beginning of financial freedom. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Now, he's not talking about money here. He's talking about some other ideas here. But this principle, the idea, so this, I'm taking it out of context, but it, there's an application beyond the context that Paul was using, all right? So I'm just letting you know. But this is what the Apostle Paul said. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't be normal. There's a way of thinking, there's a pattern that everybody in this world goes after. Don't do that. Don't do what everybody else does. However, except, however, be transformed by the what? Renewing of your what? Mind. Like, don't be like everybody else in the culture. Don't be like everybody else in the the world because there's a way of thinking, there's a conformity to a pattern that everybody else is going, and what you need to do to get off that pattern is you need to be transformed, your mind needs to be renewed, you need to begin thinking uh, about things differently, and this is especially true when it comes to finances. Because if we think about money like everybody else thinks about money, we're going to be wind up like everybody else, and that's not good. And so here's where we're going today. I'm gonna, we're going to go to the teachings of Jesus. How's that? Right? We're going to go to the teachings of Jesus. And in fact, we're going to look at two of them. Jesus taught a lot about money and possessions. We're going to look at two of his major teachings today. We're going to kind of go through them. And we're going to find out some attitude adjustments that we need. All right? Some attitude adjustments. Anybody, parent, your parents ever told you, hey, you need an attitude adjustment, son? Hey, Jesus is coming to us and say, hey, you need an attitude adjustment about this. And so that's what we're going to talk about. The first one, uh, the first passage we're going to look at comes from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. And it is kind of the end of a section in Matthew chapter 22, 23, 24, and 25. It's a massive teaching section of Jesus. All kinds of teaching there, all kinds of stories, all kinds of parables. And Jesus is talking about, among other things, he's talking about his second coming, which when he started talking about that, no one understood because he was still alive. He hadn't died on the cross and then been raised to life. He, they didn't understand, hey, hey, he's coming back again. But he's like, all right, you don't understand this. But after my resurrection, you'll understand. And so he's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about his, uh, his second coming again. And he's trying to help people understand what it's like in the kingdom of God. And so he says this in verse 14. He says this, again, in the kingdom of God, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted what? His wealth. Whose wealth is it? It's his. It's the master's, not the servant's. He had trusted his wealth to them. And then he says, to one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his what? Ability. He's, he's like, look, I understand that you have different abilities. And by the way, a bag of gold in today's terms, one bag of gold was worth $30,000. So he's like, I'm giving you $30,000. How many of you would, would be okay with one bag of gold? Yeah, that's right. I, I'm giving you two bags of gold. That's $60,000. And, and you way back there in the back, I'm giving you $150,000. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Bring it on. All right. But, 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 but wait, wait, hang on a second. It's not yours. It's his. Don't forget. It's not yours. It's his. All right. Then he went on his journey. All right. Here it is. 
The man who had received five bags of gold, $150,000, went at once, like right away, like, okay, my master is gone. I have an ability. He expects something from me. He's given me a responsibility, but he expects something from me. He went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. Now he has $300,000. So also the one with two bags of gold gained another two more. But the man, you don't want to be this guy, but that's not a good, this is a bad but right here. But the man who'd received one bag went off and dug a hole, because he's brilliant, in the ground, and he hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Here's the thing. You know what Jesus is teaching us here? He's saying, you know what? I'm giving you a responsibility, and you're accountable. I'm giving you a responsibility. I'm giving you some things in life, and you have a responsibility. I expect something from you because you have an ability, and I expect something from you, and you're accountable. And so he settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me. I understood. Like, this wasn't mine. You've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. You have been faithful with a few things. And I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Way to go. Then he goes, the man with two bags of gold also came and said, Master, you've entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained you two more. And again, the master says this. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Yay, great job, great job, great job. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came to his master and he said, Master, I knew. Like I... I understood what was going on here. I, I knew what was up. I knew that you are a hard man, that you harvest where you have not sown and gathered where you have not scattered. See, I, I already knew this about you. I mean, I know exactly who you are. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you fool, you idiot. You income poop. You, I don't know. You wicked, lazy servant. Oh, so you knew that I harvested where I've not sown and gathered where I've not scattered seed, right? Well, then you should have at least put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received in, it back with interest. Look, you knew that I expected something from you. You knew that I was going to come back and you were going to have to give an account. Then why didn't you do something with what I gave you? I entrusted this to you. And what did you do with it? Nothing. You did nothing. You should have done, I mean, the least you could have done was put it at the bank. I mean, and gotten 0.5% interest. But at least that would have been interest. The way it is, you, did, you squandered it. You didn't do anything. You, you missed the opportunity. You missed it. So take the bag of gold from him, he said to his uh, people around. Take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. Why? For whoever has will be given and uh, given more, and they will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. Look, look. Here's here's what Jesus is saying. Is he being mean? Is he being mad? No, no, no. He's just saying, look, I have an expectation. I'm giving you a responsibility, and I expect something from you. And if you're not going to actually do with my stuff, with my possessions that I'm entrusting to your care. Then I'm going to take them away from it and give it to somebody else because that's how serious I am about it producing a result. Here's the, here's, the big, here's the big deal. Attitude adjustment number one. I'm a manager, not an owner. Say it with me. I am a manager, not an owner. Say it again. I am a manager, not an owner. We don't think this way. We think it's us. We think it's ours. Mine, 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 mine. That's what the world, that's normal. Jesus said, no, 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 you, you don't understand. You don't understand. Everything you have, not yours. It's mine. You say, well, James, no, 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 no. I, you, you don't understand. I've worked for it. That's right. You, you did work for it. Who gave you the ability to work? Who gave you your talents? Who decided you'd be born in the United States of America? 
Who gave you the opportunity? You say, well, James, I worked really hard. That's, that's right. You had ability and you exercised those abilities, but who gave you those abilities? Do you know if God wanted to remove your abilities from you, he could in a heartbeat? You see, what we have is not ours. It belongs to him. But we act like owners, and that's why we get ourselves into financial trouble, because we think it's ours to do with whatever we want to do with it. No, no, no. Jesus said, hey, I'm giving you something. It's a responsibility, and you are, say it with me, accountable. Say it, accountable. I'm a manager, not an owner, not an owner, all right? Now, we're going to look at a story out of Luke chapter 16, out of Luke chapter 16. And this is a unique story of Jesus because he uses a a bad thing to illustrate a good point. And it was really confusing to everybody. And what happens, we find in this, uh, Jesus tells a story about a a bad servant who was, uh, he says, was wasting his master's resources. He wasn't stealing, he wasn't embezzling, he was just frivolous with it. He was just wasting his master's resources. And his master came to him, or his master got upset with him. and said, like, you know what? I'm going to fire you because you've wasted my resources. You've just wasted. You've blown it. you squandered it. And so the servant gets word that, is, that he's going to get fired, right? And there's nothing that can reverse the master's decision to fire him. And so he has a little bit of time before that actually happens. And he has a little bit of opportunity. And what he does is he goes out and he finds all the people that owe his master money. In other words, they're debtors to the master. And he goes up to them and he says, hey, hey, how much do you owe the master? And they're like, well, uh, we owe uh, 900, uh, you know, barrels of uh, oil. And he says, fine, here's here's the thing. I'll, I'll make you a deal right now. Change, the, change your, your, your debt there and make it 450 And if you pay me in cash for 450 your account will be settled. And they're like, oh, wow. If someone came up to you and said, hey, hey, if you'll just give me a fraction of what you really owe in your car, it can be yours. You'd say, okay, I'll do that. He went up to somebody else and said, how much do you owe? He's like, well, we, you know, 1,000 bushels of wheat. And he said, well, cut it to eight, 800 And if you pay me cash for it right now, you're going to have, oh, 20% discount? No problem, cash. And so he collects all this cash. He goes all around to all these debtors. He collects all this cash. He comes back, and his master, if you were the master, and you just realized you got shorted by your servant, what would you be? Yeah, you'd be livid. You did what? You let him off the, with my, What? But the master praised the wicked servant. He's like, that's amazing. I mean, that's ingenious. And the the servant's like, what, you're not mad at me? He's like, well, no, I'm mad at you. You're still fired. (laughs) But, like, you're brilliant because you realize I'm going to be jobless in just a second, and I have nowhere to go. I have no place. I'm not going to land on my feet. And so I've got to figure out how to land on my feet and how to make sure that I'm providing for my family. And you went around, and you made friends with all these people who owed money because they think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And when you're out on your on your luck, they're going to say, oh yeah, I remember what he did. I'm going to hire him. I'm going to help him because he helped me. You made friends for yourself. That's brilliant. You're fired. (laughs) Now, everybody was confused. They're like, wait a minute. Jesus is telling the story where the guy is praising someone who was dishonest? why, Why would Jesus praise someone who was dishonest? And Jesus makes the point. He says, here's why. Here's my point, Jesus says. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. In other words, what he's saying is, hey, there are people in this world who don't believe in God, who don't believe that there's something beyond this life, but they understand, you know what, I need to secure my future here. I need to secure my future here, so I'm going to figure out how to weigh... uh, how to make a way to secure my retirement, to secure my family, to make sure that my needs are provided for because, you know, I, I got to do that. And so they're more shrewd about that than people who understand, you know what, there's something beyond this life. There's something more to this life. And, they're, and we're, and Jesus is saying, you're not thinking of what, what's next. As, as someone who believes in, in God, as someone who believes that there's a life after this life, you're not thinking about the next. You're just thinking about all this one. You're shortchanging yourself. You have nothing stored up for the next life, which is really life. And so Jesus said in verse 9, so I tell you, here it is, watch this, use worldly wealth. Say that with me. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into what? Eternal dwellings. Use worldly wealth 
Jesus is saying, to impact eternity. Use worldly wealth to send it on ahead. Use worldly wealth so that when you get into eternity, you're going to have true riches. That you're going to have people there. It's going to be a party. But you're not doing that. Like, you're, you're blowing it all right now. You're not thinking about that. At least people in this world are thinking about their own future in this life. You're not thinking about the future that's going to be for eternity. You're not even thinking about that. And as you read Jesus' statement, you just realize, you know what? He's telling us about an attitude adjustment we need to make, and it's this one. Money is a tool. We don't think money is a tool. We don't think money is a tool for eternity. We just, I don't know what we think about it. But Jesus said, look, you got to start thinking about money as a tool, and specifically, money is a tool to impact eternity. Have you ever thought about that? That the things that God has entrusted to you are tools that he wants you to leverage for the sake of eternity, not just for the sake of putting a roof over your head, not just for the sake of feeding your family, not just for the sake of getting your kids through school and buying clothes, not for those, I mean, those are all good things, but there's something far greater than that. And that is your money, according to Jesus, and what he's teaching us here is it's a tool. It's a tool to impact eternity. Now just, just think for a second. What if for the last 10 years, You've been thinking that way, that you had adopted the attitude of Jesus about money. That first of all, uh, you're not an owner, you're just a manager. And second of all, that everything that you have is a tool that he expects you to leverage for the sake of eternity. Do you think your financial situation would be any different now? Absolutely. And it'd be better, not worse. It'd be better, not worse. And then Jesus goes on, he says this. And he's coming to another attitude adjustment. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever dis- is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So, if you have not been trustworthy, if you have not been trustworthy, there's a chance here, in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Who will trust you? It it sounds like this is almost a setup, like this is a test. And he says, and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? You realize that? And here's the attitude adjustment Jesus is talking about. Money is a test. This is what God, this is how God looks at money. This is how Jesus looks at possessions. It's a test. It's a test of whether or not you're faithful in terms of how you're leveraging it, how you're using it. For eternity. Jesus is saying, you know what? You can get rich in this life, that's great. But I'm just telling you, true riches are in the next. You're not doing anything to leverage it for eternity, and God is watching. He's just saying, are you, are, 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 are you going to be faithful for what's coming in eternity? Because here's the thing. In, in heaven, right, in eternity, we're not going to be strumming harps and sitting on a cloud. That's not how it's going to be. It's just not. If you read through the scriptures and what the scriptures teaches about heaven, you will find out that there are different levels of reward for people in eternity, that not everybody gets the same thing in eternity, that, that in this life, Jesus is watching, your heavenly Father is watching to see how you, what you do in this life in order to say what level of reward or what level of responsibility will you have in heaven. Most people don't understand that. Jesus is saying, I'm just telling you. God is watching what you do in this life, not to get you into heaven. Jesus gets us into heaven, all right? It's not about earning my way into heaven, but it is. There is a direct link with what I do with the things I have in this life, the opportunities, the resources, what I do. It has a direct direct impact on my reward in heaven and my level of responsibility in heaven. And it's for all of eternity. This is just like a little, this is the warm-up act right here, what we're seeing. It's kind of like a coach putting together, uh, you know, a team, and, and, and everybody's out there on the field or in the court, and they're just playing around, and he's watching. It's like, who's good, who's not good? Who's good, you know, who, who are the people going to make the team, who are the people not going to make the team? And he's saying, hey, if you want playing time, you've got to do well. And he's saying, I'm just telling you, what you're doing right now impacts your reward, impacts your level of responsibility in heaven. And then Jesus says, he comes to another, a final kind of attitude adjustment. He says this. No one can serve two masters. Again, same teaching, same thing. You've probably heard this one. Either you will hate the one and love the other, master, he's talking about, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. 
and you cannot serve both God and, and here's what we think. What would you put in that? Like, we, we think of light and darkness. We think of good and evil. When we think of God, we think of Satan, you know. Most of us, if we'd never heard this before, we just say, oh, well, he's talking about God and Satan, good and evil, light and darkness. That's not what he says. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. What? Yeah, yeah, you can't serve both God and money. What are you talking about? I, I don't serve money. You don't? No, I don't serve money. Really? Yeah, I, I don't serve money. Well, let me ask you this. <clears throat> of, the, of these two thoughts, which do you think more? How can I get more money so I can do X, Y, or Z? How can I, how can I earn more money? How can I get a promotion? How, how, much, how many of those thoughts do you have compared to how can I get more of God? How can I get more of God? How can I be closer to him? How can I experience him more deeply? And see, if you're saying, oh, I think about money a whole lot more than God, that means you're serving money, not God. You're chasing after money and things, not God. Your, your focus and your heart, your attention, oops, your worship is connected to that. Possessions, not God. And Jesus said, I'm just sorry, you just can't do both. You, you, you can't divide your heart when it comes to following God or chasing after money. You can't, can't do that. And here's the thing, what Jesus is saying is this, your money is a trademark. That's attitude adjustment number four. Your money is a trademark. In other words, it is an indicator of what your true heart is. It's an indicator of your character. It's an indicator of what's really going on in your life. And God is watching and Jesus is watching. He's saying, I'm just watching how all this happens and how you're managing all this stuff and what you're chasing after. Are you really chasing after money and possessions to consume and all that? Because it is an indicator of where your heart really is. It's an indicator of your true character. God's watching. And he wants us to serve him. He wants us to follow after him. He wants us to love him, not money. Not money. Now, just, again, let's just step back, just one thing. What we think of when it comes to money and possessions is we just think, man, if I could get more, right, I, I'd be good. Like if I could get an upgrade on my car, if I could get some new clothes, if I could get another upgrade on my house, if I could, if I could just get an upgrade or a promotion, like eventually, you know, you, you don't want just one more promotion in your lifetime, depending on how old you are. Uh, you, you may say, hey, I, you know, I, I've got a career path I want to follow. And the thing of it is, is you're thinking, when I finally achieve my career path, then I'll be good. I, you know, I will have made it. And there will be a day, there will be a day out there that's like, whoo man, this is bliss. Like, I have worked so hard and it's bliss. That's how we normally think. But here's the truth, here's the truth, here's the truth. And you already know the truth. That doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Jim Carrey said, I wish everybody could achieve you know, wealth and, and fame so they can find out it's not what they think it is. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm just telling you. You never achieve that thing. It's like, man, this is, this is everything I hoped it would be. It never happens. It just never happens. And yet we think that. How much different would your financial picture be? Would your financial world be? Would your heart be with the level of stress and the, and, the, and the heaviness that you find? How much would it be if you just realized, you know, 10 years ago, if you just said, if you got your attitude adjusted and just said, you know what? I'm not an owner. I'm a steward. It's not my car, it's God's car. When you go out, it's not your car, it's God's car. You know, your golf club's not your clubs. Your tennis racket, not your tennis racket, it's God's racket. Your clothes, not your clothes, it's God's clothes. Your house, not your house, it's God's house. Everything that we have doesn't belong to us. It, is, it has belonged to God. And how much different would our financial thing be if every decision that we made when it came to our finances, we ran through the grid, like, hey, hey, how am I using the owner's stuff? I mean, if I come to you and, and borrow your nice car, guess what I'm going to do with your car? I'm going to treat it real nice. You know why? Ain't mine. And if you loan me your nice car, I'm going to bring it back to you in better shape, right? How many of you would... would say, if, yeah, yeah, I, I want to do that. Why? Because it's not mine. I may bump mine around, but I'm not going to bump yours around. How many of you, we just realize, you know what? It's not my stuff. It's not my stuff. I'm going to, and, and then we started to, all the decisions we made through our lives, we started to run through the filters like, you know what? How am I doing, how am I leveraging my stuff for the sake of eternity? Because this is a tool. It's just a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool. And it's a test. It's a test of saying, you know what? If I'm faithful in this life with the things that God's given me, then he's going to give me greater reward and greater responsibility in heaven. Oh, my goodness, how am I doing with that test? How am I doing with the fact of where my true heart is, what I'm thinking about? 
I'm going to deal with all that. I'm just saying, if, if you got your attitude adjusted in these areas, your financial world would look totally different. And you would have financial freedom, peace. Jesus ends the story with this. He says this. The Pharisees who loved money, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. They weren't happy. And why weren't they happy? Because he was making them feel uncomfortable. And maybe you're sneering at me right now because I'm making you feel uncomfortable. You know why you feel uncomfortable? Here's why. I'm going to tell you why. You don't even realize why you're feeling uncomfortable right now. The reason why you're feeling uncomfortable right now is because everything you've been taught your entire life is all about getting more, spending more, and when you run out, find a way to get more and spend more. And get, It's all about consumption. It's all there to consume and to enjoy, to consume and enjoy. That's the only purpose of it. That's what you've experienced your entire life. That's the only message you've heard from our culture. That's why you're getting upset right now. But just think, just think, just think. What would your life be like if you realized, you know what? It's not mine. It's just a tool, and it's a temporary tool. This is a temporary deal right now. And the true riches and the true reward comes not in this life but in the next. What would it be like if you could get your mind wrapped around the thing that I'm seeking most, the thing that I want most does not exist on this side of eternity? It's in the next life. That brings a level of peace in this life. It's like, you know what? It's struggle now, or this, I, you know. But in the next life, I'm going to be found a faithful manager. I'm going to be found a faithful old English word, steward. You see, until we change our attitude about money, bottom line, we're never going to experience financial freedom and peace. Just never, just not going to happen. So changing your attitude about money is the beginning of financial freedom. Changing your attitude about money is the beginning of financial freedom. And here are the attitude adjustments we need. Number one, we're not an owner, we're a manager. We're not an owner, we're a manager. Again, you get this in your head and your heart, changes everything moving forward. Number two, money is a tool. That's all it is. It's just a tool. It's a tool to be leveraged for the sake of eternity, to help people come to know Jesus, to help people enter into eternity. It's just a tool. That's how God views the stuff. Like, I'm going away. I'm leaving you, you know, some resources. I want you to use them. I want you to make a profit. I, I, I want you to actually increase here for the kingdom. It's a tool. It's also a test, money is. It's a test of, are you going to do in this life and get something that's greater in the next? Because that's what it is. It's just a test. And it is a trademark. It says who you're really chasing after. Are you serving God or are you serving money? How you handle all that stuff is an indication. Now, you say, well, James, what do I do with all this stuff? Whew. Okay, glad you asked. Glad you asked. First thing is this. Pick up a book. Read chapter 1. How many of you like free? Okay. If this can change your life and get you to financial freedom, is it worth it? Yeah. Read every word in this book. Hear every message. Come and hear every message, all right? So read chapter one in this book this week, all right? You're going to get them on your way out. Everybody's going to get one. You say, well, do I need one for my wife and myself? Or Yeah. Both of you get one. Why? Because you're going to underline things that she won't and if you just read her book, then you'll just skim all the highlights and say, yeah, I don't need to read the whole thing. She gave, you know, gave me the cliff notes for it. Okay? I know how you guys think. All right? Hey, hey, hey. Honestly, with all pastoral compassion, guys, be a man, all right? Read. Or get a book yourself, get your wife a book, and have her read it out loud to you, and then you can underline it. That works too, okay? Number two, get involved in one of our small group studies. All of our 
community groups that meet in homes all across the, all across the, the city. They're doing the study. They're, we've written a brand new curriculum for this. And so they're doing the study. I want you to I'm gonna lean into this, guys. It could change your life. Be open and willing to share. We've got some worksheets along with this, uh, with this curriculum that you don't have to talk about in your community group, but maybe you should talk about them in your community group. It could go either way, but just lean in. I mean, if the next four weeks could lead you to, you know, being a year, two years, three years down the road, being completely financial freedom, wouldn't that be worth it? This could be the, the beginning. This next month could be like the, a life-changing moment for you and your family and for generations of your family. So get in one of these groups. And if you're not in a community group, we have a short-term group that meets here at our campus on Thursday nights at 6.30. It is free. All you have to do is register. Let us know that you're coming so that we can have enough chairs set up for everybody. You can register online at journeyrva.com, journeyrva.com. You can register online. It is free. Please, please, please make your, just say, you know what? I got to cancel some stuff so I can be a part of this because I want my life to change. I want my financial future to change. It's worth it. It's worth it. Everything we're going to talk about is biblically based. And number three, here's what I want you to do. Come back next week and bring a friend. Because you know what we're going to talk about next week? We're going to talk about breaking away from the bondage of debt. That's what we're going to talk about next week. How many of you got debt? Yeah, there you go. Normal. Okay. You're just normal. But I don't want to be normal. Do you want to be normal? Come back next week. And if you know somebody who else is doing debt, bring them. Because we're going to talk about it. You say, James, it's, I, it's way beyond my ability. You know what? There is hope. That's what we're going to talk about next week. All right? Okay. All right. God, thank you uh, for the opportunity to do this series, God. And I pray that this is a defining, life-changing moment that generations in the future will be changed as a result of what we're going to experience and learn and do and commit ourselves in this series. God, would you change us forever, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.